Let's go, Luke 19. We're going through the parables. Just a quick reminder of the way that we kind of look at these is we are paying a lot more attention than normal in our study of these parables to what happens before and after, the context of the parables. So we'll, we'll do that. There is also, in our little steps that I gave you, and they're in that version thing every week too, is that we approach these with an open mind. That Sometimes when we look at a parable, we kind of think we have down what, you know, I, I, I know all about that, I don't need to read that. You know, it's that one. We see the title, we move on. That's what we do. And it's, it's not good because we miss an awful lot of things. I'll give you an example of that. Wednesday nights, the last few Wednesday nights, we have been looking at judges in the men's class, and we were looking at Samson, and we decided two things. One, we really knew nothing about Samson, because we had the sterilized, sanitized Sunday school version of Samson, who is as close to the real Samson as, well, I'm trying to think of something that would be early, uh, you know, or not early, accurate enough for this. Maybe it's as close to that as what a politician is to his promises. It's, it's about that far apart, if you can imagine. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty far. But Samson gives, honestly, Samson would fit right in in Washington the way he lived his life. He just really had, had a lot going on. He had issues that you can't talk about in Sunday school. And that's why a lot of us, you know, oh, well, I know about Samson. You know, strength, hair, don't do that. Don't get a haircut, uh, which, you know, obviously some of us paid no attention to that part. But then... Uh, Sorry, I got distracted. I got my own squirrel in my head. I said some of us didn't pay attention, and I went back immediately to a conversation watching. You can tell where everybody goes to school at the basketball tournament the other night, and you knew exactly what the hair rules were by looking at the guys. You know, mullet, no mullet. You could see it. The 80s are back, and, 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 and not always the best parts, right? I, I don't, next thing is new Coke. It's all coming back. That was bad, too. And anyway... It's not real bad until your mother has a mullet. Then we pray for you, okay? There we are. Let's just add that in there. I said, I saw the squirrel. I was talking to myself, okay? I was talking to myself. Samson. When we look at Samson, we realize there's so much more going on there. And we learn so many things and uh, chewed on some things. And we actually, the second lesson of Samson was, it probably was best we did it in the men's class. Because Samson was such a mess, uh, and some of the conversations in there were probably only men's class approved. Uh, you know, nothing bad, but just the way it was. We, we, were, we were pretty honest about all the things he was dealing with. The parables are this way, and we've already seen this in several of them. That sometimes we, we kind of get our cookie cutter idea of what a parable is about, and then we just we don't pay attention. But context informs us so deeply about what's going on before, during, and after a parable that sometimes it completely changes the meaning. For me, this is one of those. I am guilty. I'm talking about myself again. I've said many times, I preach to me, and when I say we, it's me and the mouse in my pocket. Y'all get to listen. If you are guilty of the same things, need to learn the same things, then you get to do that. And there you go. Or you snore. Either way, we both win, right? So in this one, I I'm guilty of skipping over it like it's the other parable that has has the talents in it. This is the parable of the ten minas. These are both just forms of money. And when we get to the one on the talents, we'll talk about that because it's, you know, we always say, oh, well, it's our talents and gifts. Well, not exactly, no. But that's another story. This is not that parable. This one's about something else entirely. Maybe. Not even what you've ever thought it was about. And to get that, we have to look at what happens right before. And we're gonna, not going to read it all, but just to remind you, Jesus is at Zacchaeus' house when all of this happens. And Zacchaeus has just stood up and said, I'm convicted. I repent. And if I cheat anybody, I'll pay them back. I'll pay them back four times. I'll do everything I need to do to make this right because Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are. I believe you're the Messiah. I believe you're the Lord. I believe. And so he changes his life because of what he learned about Jesus and the kingdom at that supper table that day. Okay? That's the context. Now let's read it and then we'll, we'll talk context just a little bit more. Verse 11. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him. And sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. 
When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. That's hard in English, isn't it? You got ten minas more. That's new math. That's not the way we count. Verse 17, and he said, I told you, squirrels this morning. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in very little. You shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, and you were to be over five cities. Then another came saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank and at, at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And he said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. It's like, that's not fair. I will tell you that, to, or excuse me, I tell you that everyone who has more will be given. From the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Well, there's your happy new year pick-me-up, right? The ending right there at the end of the parable. Goodness, it's a rough one. And um, it's, it's clearly not the same as the one in Matthew because the one in Matthew does have one person who is then held accountable, uh, but there's, there's no slaughter. And of course, all the numbers are different, but the whole purpose and the context is different. There he's talking about whether or not we seize to the opportunities that we are given and whether or not those talents that we do have, which the opportunities are given to us for, are actually put into use. But here, it's something else entirely different. And we'll see that as we look at the different personalities involved. Let's go back to context again. Well, thank you, you did that one too. First, uh, they are still, as I said, at Zacchaeus' house. He's just repented. And the same people then are crowded around. And that group of people that are around him are people who believe. They're his disciples. There are people that are, are curious, both from a positive and a negative stance, uh, really skeptical people, and also people who have heard and think, you know, well, maybe there's something to this Jesus. They're all there. Also there are the people who want him dead. There are people who follow him everywhere he went, stirring up trouble. And he's getting close to Jerusalem, close to their kind of home base and territory. And they're there, and they're listening, and they're thinking about how they can lay their traps. And he speaks to all these people in this parable. This is so close to Passion Week that the very next verse is the triumphal entry after he finishes this parable. Okay? So get all of those things in your mind. You think about that, the triumphal entry, and you have all of these people who are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, means Lord save us. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name uh, of our God. And why are they saying that? Because they think they want this new king who comes on the colt of a donkey. I said they think because we find out as the story unfolds over the week, that many of them were not prepared for what he was bringing. And this is, again, part of what the parable is all about. Okay, So, a little bit more. Let's look at key phrases. It's like you're in sunset this morning. And now we'll look at key phrases. And uh, verse 11, actually, just the one verse, has a few different key phrases that you want to catch. I love it when parables do give you this many hints. Okay? They're not all hidden things. Uh, when it says, because, 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 we might know why he's telling them this story. Right? The first one, because he was near Jerusalem. That's what I was just talking about. He knows the events. He knows the people. He knows the attitudes. He knows the motives. And he's getting close. He also knows why he's going to Jerusalem. Not just the cross. Some of the events that will happen before the cross involve judgment as he cleanses the temple. 
They will involve setting things straight as he preaches truth to people who don't want to hear it. They will involve conversations about, are you really the king of the Jews? All of those things are in his head and heart, and they surround this parable. So because he was near Jerusalem and these things are about to happen, he tells this story. Changes how you read the story, doesn't it? The second reason he says that Luke tells us that he told the story then is because they suppose that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. That the reign of God was to appear immediately. And they also have a lot of things they think about the kingdom and the reign of God that were not exactly correct. They thought that it was going to be a military takeover, a coup, a getting rid of, a booting out of the Roman authorities and, and, and oppressors. And they were excited about that. And so they're sitting there thinking this is 1776 and Jesus is like, no, I'm bringing you to church, buddy. And that didn't go over well. Okay? The revolution was going to happen. It was going to happen in their hearts, in their lives, in their priorities, and in how they would live from the cross onward. They didn't all receive that well, did they? Hence the cross. The third is this, because they supposed that the king, or excuse me, I jumped ahead of myself, and no, I didn't. Did those say? Well, there you go. I had something else there. We'll move on. Number 11. <laughs> go read verse 11. It's in there. Uh, there were those few, and then in 14 it says, we do not want this man to reign over us. Now that's interesting, this little phrase in the parable. He starts telling the parable, and he says, you know, after he's given them the minus, and after he, he goes off, what do they do? It says, they gather together a delegation. It's a weird part of the parable because it doesn't come back in at the end of the story. Because he's not just telling us a story. It's not just an illustration. He's actually telling us a history of what's happening and about to happen. They don't want Jesus to reign over them. You know how we know that? They say so. They say so in that next week. In John later, let me just go ahead and click through these so I don't have to think. In John, he's going to tell them, or excuse me, they are going to say in response to Pilate, we don't like this guy. We don't want him to reign over us. We have no, what a line. Do you ever wonder if the thunder clapped when they said this? We have no king but Caesar. In any other context, the very same men would have wanted people who said that stoned for blasphemy. But they shouted it at the top of their lungs. We have no king, not this man, this Messiah, this king of the Jews is no king of the Jews. We don't want him. Jesus had just said that's the way it was going to go. They're going to send a delegation to try and cast him off and to do him in. And they did, didn't they? So it's kind of a prophetic parable, not the only one. In uh, verse 17, we get another because. It's in a reward. When he comes back and he has the men line up. And he just gives us a few examples. The first one comes with uh, 10 minus. He's made 10 minus more. He says in response... Because you have been faithful, because you've been faithful, here are ten cities. You know, there's no correspondence between ten minas and ten cities. Okay? That's really uh, an extravagant reward for what he did. We would call that grace. Yeah, did he do something? Yes. Was he faithful? Yes. Did he do some works? Yes. But he was rewarded far beyond that. Uh, he was only investing... Ten days labor. Okay, that's, that's the amount of money. He's invested ten days labor. He's made ten days labor. So he's come out with less than a month's pay. So, why is he so rewarded? John says in 1 John chapter 3 that God lavishes his love on us. Lavishes. Generously. Just pours it all out. More than we deserve, more than we can comprehend. We didn't earn all of that. God freely pours it over us as a blessing. And he's generous with all of that. Now this guy was faithful. But he was rewarded beyond his faithfulness. But still a reason. Because 
He was faithful. You know how it goes. Next guy, the same thing happens. The numbers are different, but the level of grace is the same. And then you get the guy with the, with the handkerchief. Okay? I think this is probably a good lesson. Uh, we probably needed it two years ago. It would have been more relevant, right? And that is never wrap your offering in a snot rag. But it's still really quite relevant with the flu going around this year. But this is what he does. Can you imagine? You show up before the Lord. Lord, here are all the blessings you've given me in my life. Really? Yes, this is, this is them. This is what you gave me. And what did you do with it? I wrapped it in my snot rag. I washed it. It's fine. Really? This is what you did with it. Yeah, yeah. Why did you do that? He says, well, I know that you're harsh. You're a mean guy. You, 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 want, you want more than you deserve. Does he want more than he deserves, this master in the parable? Yeah, he expects it. He expects it. Is it a direct correlation to Jesus in that sense? Is Jesus a mean guy who takes what he does? No, no, don't. This is one of the things that those rules of a parable don't get bogged down too much in the details and over uh, evaluate it, okay? Because we can overdo it. Don't do that. Jesus is not like that. God is not like that. But the guy thought his master was like that. The master does not confirm really whether or not he was. He says, this is what you think. You thought this is what I was? And if that's what you thought, then that's how I'm going to judge you. What if we're judged by what we think God is, regardless of what he actually is? Would that be a scary thought? Because we might have some inaccurate thoughts that come back around to bite us. It'd be a problem. This is, this is what happened with this guy. He says, but if you thought that, I'll judge you by that because it clearly ruled over your actions. How did you do with that thought? I hid it in a handkerchief. I didn't do anything. I buried it. Well, that's great. Very productive. You know, you could have at least gotten that little bit of interest over at the bank. That would have been, that would have been better than just folding it up in there. Come on. He says, I tell you what we're going to do. And he calls the guards. I want you to come and I want you to take his away from him. Give it to that guy. And there's the protest. It doesn't say who it came from, but we could probably guess. Well, that guy has ten. Yes. You know why he has ten? Because he was faithful. How often have you struggled with jealousy of people who are faithful? When God could have said to you, I blessed you. Just as freely. I didn't expect you to live like them. I didn't expect you to necessarily have the gifts of them. I didn't expect you to have the time of them. I didn't expect you to maybe accomplish. You didn't have to be uh, a missionary. You didn't have to ever leave your hometown. You didn't even have to leave your block. But I did give you that block. And how many times have we looked at that and said, Well, I don't really have much to offer. So I'm just fold it up and put it away. Nowhere in the parable, I think this is important we get this, nowhere in the parable is the man judged because he was just a one minor guy. That's not a judgment. Not at all. He's just judged for what he did with his little. We're not going to be judged based on the person next to us or some hero in the faith or a, a grandfather or grandmother who was awesome. Those are all blessings. We know those people, but we're not going to be judged by that. What we're going to be judged by is, what did you do with all that God gave you and your stewardship? All of it. Not just gifts, not just talents, not just abilities. What are you going to do with your coffee pot? What are you going to do with your kitchen table? What are you going to do with your money? What are you going to do with your time? What are you going to do with your priorities? Whose are they? And on Thursday mornings, we've been studying through Leviticus. And I know some, some, some of you are like, oh, Lord Jesus, why? I know, I know, I get it. There are boils, and we did go there. Dee wants us to go back. She's, she's a fan of Dr. Pimple Popper and thought, hey, it's, it's like it's in the Bible. Uh, but we found some interesting things. One of them this week was in Leviticus 25 where it talks about uh, how, you, how you steward your farmland, and it has a few different things about what you do with your land. And in one of those things, he says, I want you to remember, this is God speaking, I want you to remember 
the land is never yours. And he's just been talking about deeds and whose land it is. He says, but you remember when you get your land, it is never yours. It is God's. And you need to submit it to the reign of his kingdom. It's God's. You use it like it's God's. So whatever you have and wherever you are and whatever you do, whatever your profession, all of those things, whose are they? Oh, y'all had a good chance to get a gold star. Who's, whose is all that? God. It's God's, right? It's God's. Don't fold it up and put it in a napkin. He gave it to you, but he gave it to you to a purpose and to an end. And he intends to actually, yeah, come back and see is the way that you use that, is it faithful? Do you actually reflect in your attitude and in your heart? Because this is a heart story. Do you reflect the heart of someone who really believes God is my God, Jesus is my Lord, and my life is first and foremost and always His. And no fear should hold me back from living like it. Because that's what this guy did. He said, well, there's things I don't like about this guy. And so I, I, I'm just not going to do it. I'm afraid he's going to beat me anyway. I might as well just take the beating and be done. You sure about that? That may not be the way you want to go. It wouldn't have been the way this guy would have wanted to go had he read his own parable first. Right? So remember all those things. Let's, let's uh, talk about this. None of this is just talk. It's none of it's a cutesy parable. It's not a cutesy parable at all. The ending is still there. We're going to get to that. It's meant to actually change us. And it's meant to actually shape us. N.T. Wright says this, Jesus is not speaking about God, God's kingdom, and God's return to Zion. He, Jesus is embodying it. Okay, this goes back to context. I told you we'd come back to that. When we come back to context, we see that Jesus is actually living the very thing he's talking about in real time. Here's a parable about a king who goes off, a nobleman who goes off, and he comes back and he holds their feet to the fire for what they've done. What is Jesus going to do in Jerusalem? It's not 1,000 years later. It's not 2,000 years later. It's not 5,000 years later. It's not even 70 years later. It's right here, right now. Jesus is saying, I'm coming to town. Your king has returned. I am here. It's not just the second coming. In that week, he was going to walk into his town and walk into his father's temple and say, is this really what you've done with it? You've buried it? This isn't bearing witness. And those people actually were trying to make money. But it wasn't what the temple was about. And he says, what are you doing here? And he drives them out of the temple for the second time. I know people who say, oh, well, that would never have happened twice. And I always want to ask them, do you know people? Do you, like, get out of your house? Humans make the same mistakes over and over again all the time. Like cockroaches, they came back in. I guarantee you, on the Monday after the resurrection, those tables were back in that temple. If not before. Some of those people picked him up before he was done walking off. Because they were people who rejected their king. But in real time, he says, the king comes back. You're right. But you're thinking that it's going to be only to come and boot out the Romans. But let me tell you about a story where the king comes back and holds the feet of his own to the fire. And that's what he's about to do when he goes into Jerusalem. So there is that. He's not just talking. It's real time for Jesus and for those people. And if Jesus was as serious about the rejection that would happen in Jerusalem, where they send the delegation and say, we don't want him as our king where they put on full display how little they've done with the gifts that they were given with the good news of a coming Messiah and instead reject him. If he's that serious, then, then will he be that serious when he returns again? Is there any reason we would think he wouldn't be? It's a serious parable. You know, we can try and make those things lighter and everything, but... Jesus told it for a reason. He told it for a reason. We need to know it. 
how serious will he be when he comes about the gifts that we are given as individuals, about the stewardship we have with the gospel as the kingdom of God and as a congregation? How serious will he be? You say, well, I don't like talking about that. I don't want to talk about it. No judgment. No, nobody really does. That one guy didn't. So he tucked his judgment in a handkerchief and put it away. Did it work? No. We get two reactions in this context. You had the guy in the parable who got scared and put it away. But remember the beginning? What was at the beginning? It's Zacchaeus. And we have a choice about which of these two people that we will be. Will we be Zacchaeus or will we be the people who shout, we have no king but Caesar? Jesus ain't going to tell me how to run my life. Ain't no book going to tell me how to run my life. I had a lady say that one time. Sure did. In a church in New York one time. A lady said, well, that's that's an old book. And these are new times. And she claimed to be a Christian. She claimed to be one of those people in his household. She claimed to visit the temple now and then. But her heart told a whole different story. And she, I'm not guessing, she wanted us to know what her heart really thought. What about you? It's two kinds of people. There's Zacchaeus. I think that'd be the better way to be, wouldn't it? He jumps up in joy. He jumps up in repentance. And he leaves that dinner table. A man with a new eternity. And a new hope. And a new king. Or you can be the other guy. You know, it, it, it's, it's all up to us. It's just a choice that, that Jesus continually puts in front of us. Charles Spurgeon, old time preacher in London, said this about it. And this is in his, his remarks on this chapter. It is always so. The gracious and the faithful man obtains more grace and more means of usefulness. Like the guy with the ten minus gets ten cities. You say, well, he already had ten. Yeah, yeah. People who show faithfulness are always going to be blessed with more opportunity to be faithful. Isn't that 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9? That those who, in talking there about helping other people who are poor and going through a famine, he says, if you will be faithful in this and you will keep your promise to give to these people, you know what I'll do? I'll make sure you not only have the money to give, I'll make sure you have the money to give again the next time there's a need. He doesn't say, I'll get you rich. He doesn't say you can be a Rolls Royce preacher. And what he says is, I'll make sure that you're able to help the next hungry person and the next hungry person and the next hungry person. I will make sure. Yeah, that's what he does. He just gives more and more grace and means of usefulness while the unfaithful man sinks lower and lower and grows worse and worse. We must either make progress or else lose what we we have attained. There is no such thing as standing still. More modern way of putting it, we often say you're either growing or dying. It's one or the other. And that's not talking numbers, that's talking about our heart and our spirit and our soul. Numbers are the fruit of that growth. But you're either growing or you're dying. Peter put it this way. Peter, who was at that table, Peter, who heard Jesus say these words, who saw the parable both be told and then unfold in the coming week. This is what he said in the beginning of his second letter. I love this passage. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness. He's given you gifts. He's given you attitudes. He's given you knowledge. He's given you wisdom. He's given you strength. He's given you opportunities. He's given you all these things. And what does he expect? That you add to your ten, five, or one mina. Add to your faith. Even more, virtue, virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours, this is a promise. Pay close attention to this. I always highlight this because it's so important. Look at this again, verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you, a promise, from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. At times you may struggle with, I just don't know how I can, what does it say? Grow in your virtue, grow in your knowledge, grow in your self-control, grow in your godliness, your godlikeness. 
Not the warped version the serpent sold to Eve, but the awesome version we see in Jesus' example of love and kindness and steadfastness. He makes a promise. You will never be unfruitful. You will never be unproductive as long as you are growing like this. It's a promise. Because God will look at that and say, you know what? You've done well. Here, let me give you some more. See what you do with that. It's an awesome opportunity we have as Christians to see our lives actually become more and more at a time when so many people are becoming less and less. Verse 9 speaks to that. Whoever lacks these qualities, this kind of ends like the parable, sorry. (laughs) Whoever lacks these parables is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former self. So the end is... Don't be that guy. This is like, it's like Peter was thinking about the parable when he wrote that last verse. Don't be that guy. Be Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus didn't just get his life back. He got opportunities back. He got the chance to grow back. He got the chance to see what God had intended him to be all along. And there's no age limit on this. There's no time limit. If you're breathing, you have that chance. You have that opportunity for God to pour more life and more blessing and more opportunity for you to bear fruit for the kingdom into you. It's an incredible thing. But he does expect us to do something with it. Because what was that key phrase back in there? Because you were faithful. So what are you going to be today? What are you going to be tomorrow and every day God gives you? Let's be faithful. Yeah, be faithful and see what God does with it. If you need to give your life to Christ today, we always extend this invitation because we want so desperately for you to know the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Nobody should leave here worried about being a one mina person. You should leave here knowing that you get to be a Zacchaeus. Some of you are already that short, but you need his heart. I got that in there. You know, you need his heart. Give it to him today. Baptize that thing today. And give your life to the Lord and see what he changes and what he brings to you in the rest of your life.